Yeah, hello. Uh, very nice to see so many faces after yesterday's party. Um, we're here to present you the topic code plagiarism. It's not really a talk uh, that fits perfectly into this event because it's not really about information security, but I think it's very interesting for most of us uh, because most of us are creating software and distributing software and um, yeah, it's useful to know the legal background of distributing software. Um, <coughs> As you can see, we are two speakers. Um, we have divided uh, our responsibilities. My part will be, um, I will uh, do a lot of storytelling. I will present a story that I have experienced a few years ago. So therefore, I will be responsible for the entertainment part of this talk. And my friend Luca will be <laughs> bringing the content. He is responsible, uh, responsible for the legal part. <coughs> Uh, well, my name is Mark Ruff. I'm here from Switzerland, working for a company in Zurich, uh, primarily um, doing penetration testing. I have a website and I have published a few books. Uh, some of them I, I am proud of and some of them I aren't very proud of. Yeah, my name is Luca Dalmolin. I'm also from Switzerland, born in Zurich, studied in Zurich, and now I work in Zurich. I work at uh, Homburger, which is a uh, big law firm in Zurich, and I work there in the IPIT practice group, which is a group which mainly focuses on intellectual property law and also IT-related legal problems, how Mark calls them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, <clears throat> first of all, we are going to talk about code plagiarism. Uh, here's the definition of the Oxford English Dictionary, what plagiarism is. I think um, most people in information security business are quite familiar with the problem of plagiarism, uh, also because of a person that calls him ha uh, himself the number one hacker of the world. Um, but here we are going to discuss code plagiarism, so uh, somebody using someone else's code. And here starts the, uh, the storytelling. My story starts 2003, a few years ago. Um, most of you might remember the time where it was not very easy to do exploitation. It was very hard if you were a professional pen tester to collect all your exploits, to, to maintain them, to um, provide a certain level of quality for your exploits. Um, I thought it was always very annoying if I was at the customer site and I had to do some exploitation to find the right exploits and to, to prepare them correctly and to remember the syntax and what they were doing and what kind of payload I have to use and whatever. So I thought, okay, uh, maybe it's a good idea for me to create a software which would help me to do this kind of exploitation, to, to streamline the whole process. And I started to create uh, an exploiting framework which wasn't or, or didn't become such famous like Metasploit. Um, but this is or, or was my project, the Attack Toolkit, uh, the ATK. <coughs> um, the basic idea was uh, it should be very, very simple to create exploits. So if I was at the customer site, I, uh, the, the best thing would be I would be able to create an, an exploit in uh, just a few minutes. Um, the whole framework was plugin based, so the, the, the exploits were stored in different files, like uh, it was very popular with Nessus back at the time. <coughs> and it was a, a real fun project for me because I, I, I was doing something uh, that helped me on a daily basis, and I had the chance to, um, to see how other projects were working. For example, I uh, created um, a very dynamic reporting. Um, module which allowed me, for example, to create reports that looked like it came from a Nessus uh, vulnerability scanner. I was supporting different formats, uh, the Nessus uh, format, uh, and in some cases the ATK was e even possible to run uh, nozzle scripts from the Nessus project. But I was using ASL scripts, ASL stands for attack scripting language, which was a very, very simple language to create my exploits. That uh, the goal was always um, uh, it would be the best if I was able to create an exploit with just one liner. So it was very easy and very quick to create exploits. Uh, the project became pretty popular. Um, 
there were different websites and different books that mentioned the project and I was very happy I had contact with different people. The uh, funniest thing was it became very popular in the Asian culture, which raised uh, or which rose different problems, for example. If someone from Taiwan sends you um, an email and says, hey, I have a problem with your software, I can't execute whatsoever, and you say, usually you say, okay, please send me a screenshot of the error message. And if you get an error message from a Taiwanese Windows system, you can't really uh, understand what's going on, and therefore the debugging process was very different from uh, as I knew it back then. <coughs> But with every adventure, there are some, some risks. Uh, and in my case, and by the way, I'm using all original documents in this presentation. So most of the conversations are in German. So uh, perhaps not all of you get the content, but uh, I'd like to, to provide the highest level of authenticity for the whole presentation. One day I received this email from a person I didn't know back then, <coughs> but he uh, followed my work and he knew a few people around me. And he said he was a journalist that received an, an application he should uh, review for uh, a magazine or, or a website. It was a security scanner and when he launched the security scanner, he saw that there were, were um, a large amount of familiarity, familiarities with my ATK project. So he wrote me this email and said, okay, it might be that they, that they are using some kind of code or some kind of stuff you were using in your project. Um, I can remember very good, I, at this time I was at the customer site uh, doing a pen test of an online banking, received this email and I was very eager to go home and to see what really was going on. I went home, <coughs> downloaded the software, they were providing a trial version on a website. I downloaded the software, installed the software, executed the software, and as you can see on the left-hand side is the ATK, and on the right-hand side is the exploiting module of this software. And as you can see, um, there are exactly the same plugins, there. exactly the same exploit plugins I was providing were also in their product. <clears throat> I have to say, uh, say I have released my software under the general public license and they were selling their software for several hundred euros. So I wasn't very pleased because it wasn't really my idea of publishing a software. Um, I wrote them an email. Th their software was pre-compiled. They didn't um, um, obey the, 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 the general public license. I wrote them a letter explaining, okay, it might be that there is some confusion, you might not be very familiar with the GPL, and I'd like to say, uh, please obey the GPL, um, uh, name the, the source, the original source, and make the source code of your application, or at least the parts you were taking from my project, also open source. Um, I sent this letter, very friendly letter, I took my time, and I received another letter from their lawyer, <clears throat> and he told me, uh, we can't see your problem. Um, the, the, the main developer of this product is um, very ill. He's going to die. But he told us that he uh, didn't take any code from your project. So <clears throat> I'm very sorry for the person that is going to die. But that doesn't really concern me because um, yeah, I have my... Uh, yeah, opinions too. So I wrote another letter <coughs> and said, no, please be kind, please, uh, I have proof, please don't make this any harder than it is and do what makes sense. Um, once again, I received another letter and they said, no, we really, we don't care what your problem is, we don't see a problem, please go away. So I thought, okay, that's not funny, it doesn't make sense. Um, so I wrote another letter. But before I um, thought, okay, I have to do, I have to collect all the proof that that uh, supports my my opinion, and uh, I was starting to do a an, an comparison between the two applications. Um, I did also start a project, which uh, some of you might be familiar with, uh, my fingerprinting projects, the Recon projects, for example, HTTP Recon. 
uh, which tries to identify web servers. <coughs> I was also creating uh, two different uh, projects called Text Recon and Code Recon. And those do pretty much the same, but for, for text, for written text, and for code. So the idea was you can uh, load code into the application, and the application does a fingerprint of the source code and determines if there are familiarities between or, or, or um, things that match that would indicate plagiarism. Uh, there are different approaches to do this, um, but in my case it wasn't really helpful because the, the, the target application I was analyzing was pre-compiled and I hadn't had access to the source code at that moment. Um, but the plugins they were using uh, were in a separate file and were accessible with a common text editor, so I was able to extract all the, the, the plugin parts that they took from my project, and these are exact the same plugins I was using. Um, plagiarism isn't that easy, because when, um, whenever I had to use a string in my plugins, I used the string ATK, because ATK stands for Attack Toolkit, and um, it, it did make sense for me to use the string ATK in all my plugins. The plugins they took from me they ha hadn't the chance to change that, so 12 plugins in their product were naming my project ATK. <coughs> then one plugin was also mentioning my website because the test I was doing uh, was accessing my web server and it was responsible to find out if the connectivity was given, so even my website was mentioned in their product. And whenever I have to use a random number in code or, or wherever, I use my birthday, and uh, two plugins were mentioning my birthday in their application. And of course, uh, there were some typos and some, some mistakes, so programming, some programming errors in my plugins, and they took all of them into their product. So I gave them a, a last chance, wrote the third letter, <coughs> and explained with two examples that I have proof. Um, not even sure, I think I have mentioned the fact with the, the ATK string and, and uh, the fact with my birthday, uh, and said, okay, hey, here is the proof you can't deny that uh, if your software mentions my birthday, that perhaps you have taken uh, my code. Um, then they ignored this fact completely. Um, instead, they offered me to publish a book uh, with them, as I, I said, no, I don't not really have an interest to publish a book with you because uh, you're, uh, yeah, what you're doing is not really what I like to do. Uh, but they took the time to try to cover up the thing that I mentioned in my last letter. They uh, corrected in the new release of the application, so the new release didn't mention uh, my birthday and the ATK string. The problem was the person that was correcting those plugins didn't understand what he was doing and he was rendering all the plugins or most of the plugins useless because they weren't doing, uh, weren't doing the same anymore that they had to do. <coughs> so yeah, <laughs> now to my part. Um, it's going to be a little bit less storytelling, but I will try just to give you an overview on, well, some legal issues which are related to the problem Mark had and problem he was talking about right now. Um, it will be a rather limited overview. I think we do not have time to cover everything, as you may imagine. And please also note that um, what I'm talking about here is not really well established in, in legal literature and in jurisprudence, in, in especially in Switzerland, because so far there just have not been enough cases to, to have, let's say, solid case law. So. Don't take everything for granted. Um, it really depends on, on the very specific case. And last preliminary remark is that I just going to speak about Swiss law. Um, we don't have the time to like to go beyond this, so it will be focused on on a Swiss perspective. Uh, if we go into the subject, um, we need to talk about the protection of software in general. And uh, in mainly what is of relevance is the Swiss Copyright Act. Um, this act, which I have uh, put a little extract here, 
um, regulates in general the protection of software under Swiss law. Uh, the relevant provision in order to determine whether or not a piece of software or software entirely is protected by a copyright act is the de definition of the term work, which you see here in Article 2 of the Swiss Copyright Act. Uh, accordingly, you need to have a literary and artist creation of the mind that possesses individual nature. So, you see that this provision includes two main features. The first is that you need to have a creation of the mind, and the second is the indiv individuality. Um, having or establishing what is a creation of the mind is, well, let's say rather easy. It means that you need to have the result of a uh, human reasoning, so of the process of uh, creating something done by a human mind. This is to be seen as opposed to um, the mere result of a technical process which is not really influenced by, by human mind. Um, the second part, the individuality, is less easy well, to define. What is generally acknowledged is that it's understood to require on one side a, a leeway or a room to, to create an individual solution. So if you have just one single way which you can pursue in order to achieve a goal, you don't have a leeway, so no individual creation is possible. Um, on the other side, it's not enough to have this room, but you also need to make use of it. So if you, in spite of having like a whole lot of possible solutions, you just choose the most obvious and banal one, you won't make an individual creation. Um, so yeah, if, if we have this, we see uh, that we go forward in the, in the definition. Uh, we have the, the clear statement that computer programs shall also be deemed works and protection is not only granted to uh, an entire product, but also to drafts and parts of an entire work. Um, that may be with regard to software, for instance, a single file or a functionality of software which may be granted protection under the Copyright Act as long as it qualifies as work. Um, uh, more specifically, what may qualify as work if we if we go to the well to the process of developing software? Uh, at first, it may be the the plan of a software, the concept where you, uh, after having made your thoughts, you go well. You take a paper, you write down what you're going to do. You make a concept. You may do it electronically rather than on paper. I don't know, um, but you have to to produce something already at this stage. So what it's definitely not enough is that you just have an idea in your mind which ha you have not yet uh, laid down in any tangible form, I'd say. Um, but still, you don't have to, well, copyright protection is granted already at the rather early stage, I would say. Um, if we think further in this process, uh, you're going to, well, very simplified speaking, uh, you're going to write your source code, and there, this is definitely the process where you, where you try to put your indi individual solution into a piece of work. So there you will have most likely a work which is protected under the Copyright Act. So we may conclude that mostly source code is granted copyright protection. However, um, if you have uh, your lines of source code, uh, there will be, on one side, you, there will be your, your individual solution, what you have really thought about, but there are also other parts which, well, we lawyers will call it boilerplate, which you just use, uh, like, pre-done by someone else, and these parts of the source code then won't be granted copyright protection, because it's either it's not your own uh, work, or it does simply not qualify as work because it's very, very standard and just nothing individual in there. Um, if you then go further, you create the object code. And as I understand it, this is generally done not by, well, by yourself, but it's done by means of, by use of compilers. And as such, it is actually is a result of a mere technical process. So if we think back of what I've said before, uh, 
there is a question, well, does it not qualify as work because it's not the result of a human process? But um, to the extent that what you've done before when writing down the source code, this is even if, well, physically produced by means of compilers, it is actually the result of the source code. So in the end, you have what is granted, well, the copyright protection which is granted to the source code to the extent that this is found again in the object code, also the object code is granted copyright protection. Um, it may sound a little bit abstract, but yeah. <laughs> um, if we ask ourselves now, well, individuality, very nice, but what does it really mean? Um, I can say that there has been a rather recent decision of the Zurich Court of Appeals uh, where it was stated that the threshold is rather low. So unless you do really have a software which experts consider being banal or commonplace, ordinary, trivial, uh, as soon as you go beyond this, it will usually be qualified as work and thus granted, be granted copyright protection. So we can conclude that as a matter of principle, software is generally granted copyright protection as long as we do not have exceptionally banal software at hand. Um, just really quick, uh, other possible protections we so far have only spoken about um, copyright protection. Um, there are questions whether you may acquire protection by means of patent law, brand law, design law, or the Unfair Competition Act. Um, still, with regard to the situation in Switzerland, patent law is mostly not um, considered being able to, to grant uh, sufficient protection. I say mostly because it depends on the way an invention is defined under Swiss law, which always requires actually to be, to be a technical invention. And the software which is generated, for instance, in order to uh, reflect a, a process in banking, online banking software, does usually not qualify as technical invention. Um, Brand or design law may be considered, but only to a very limited extent. I mean, you may protect your, the name of your software uh, under brand law, but you have to register it with, a, with an institute. So as opposed to copyright protection, which is granted in the moment the work has been created without any further action required, uh, brand protection is only granted once you have registered your brand with the a, with a Swiss Institute of Intellectual Property. Um, then we would have the Unfair Competition Act. Therein, I mean, it's, a, it's an act that regulates uh, competition, an unfair competition. Um, you may deem it unfair competition what Marx's adversaries have done with uh, his tool. Uh, so therein is a provision that states that if you, by, by means of technical reproduction procedures, you copy the work someone else has created and then use it for your own benefit, that this qualifies as unfair competition. So one might think, well, this is what they have done. However, um, it is generally considered that unfair competition law shall not grant prote protection in addition to what is already granted by the Copyright Act. And so if the, 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 the copier, I say, the one who, who takes your work, uh, has to have at least minimal efforts in order to then be able to, to benefit from the things he has copied, uh, this is already enough to not have this provision to apply on, the, on a case. So in his case, even though they took his plugins, they, they, they took many things he did, uh, they packed it in an own piece of software, uh, they made marketing efforts, and this will already qualify as sufficient own um, efforts. So uh, we probably have to conclude that the only protection which is really valuable for Mark and similar cases is the Copyright Act. Yeah, <clears throat> back to. 
So I had contact with different different lawyers in different countries and asked them back then uh, what their opinion was. I had contact with lawyers in Switzerland, in Germany and in the United States. And uh, you have to remember, it's it's a few years ago, and the general public license wasn't or, or uh, wasn't not so so popular back then like today it is. And as Luca mentioned, in the legal world, this kind of problems isn't very popular still, not very popular today. So um, <coughs> all lawyers told me uh, back then um, I might be right, of course, um, but the problem is uh, they can't. Um, assure that uh, the, in the end I would become the right that I deserve. And um, I wouldn't be able to um, uh, request a certain amount of money that uh, I would receive from the, the company that stole my code, because I wasn't able to tell uh, how much money I have lost during this whole case, because I was publishing the software freely, I hadn't really um, a damage in my income. Um, of course, as most Swiss person, I have um, uh, legal insurance, but of course my legal insurance wasn't covering this case. Um, and uh, it would have taken me a lot, a lot of time and a lot of money to, to um, yeah, get what I really deserved. So um, this wasn't really an option for me, the legal processing, so I decided let's have some fun and um, I took this whole adventure to see how can I interact with the media and how will this whole situation progress if I make this uh, situation public. So I prepared a broad media offensive um, yeah, to see what's going on. <coughs> And in this example, uh, Heise Online published an article about this case, and it was pretty interesting. Um, I think most of uh, people speaking German know Heise Online. Um, they have a board uh, in where people are able to discuss the, the, the posting, and um, there were around 400 posts um, covering my case, and nearly 390 agreed with me that this case was, was pretty strange and um, I didn't get what I deserve. And about 10 people were pretty weird and said I was wrong. Um, so, um, while I was pre preparing the media offensive and while I was analyzing the, the, the target software, I realized something very, very funny. Um, or, or, or uh, you know, it was, this was a little spoiler. I realized who the person is that was responsible for um, stealing my source code. The problem is all lawyers told me I shouldn't name the person's name and I shouldn't name the, the, the company that stole my code. But I'd like to show you a little clip from IT Crowd. Um, some people might know the c uh, series running on BBC. And uh, it's pretty funny because the name of the person is mentioned in this clip. <coughs> I hope it's loud enough. Peter, I got that link for the Firefox extension you were asking me about. What's your email address? Uh, do you have a pen and paper? Uh, I'm recording. It's uh, <laughs> filepeter at hotmail.com. File Peter. Uh, why file Peter? Well, file is my second name. Oh, right, I see. Uh, Peter File. Who's a pedophile? <laughs> no, no. His name is Peter File. His name is Pedophile. Don't say it like that. <laughs> It sounds like pedophile. Isn't that what he just said? No. Peter file. Pedo file. Peter file. Who's a pedophile? No one. Right. It just sounds like pedophile. No, no, it doesn't. It does a bit. <laughs> Peter file. Peter file. Yeah, no, it does. Peter file. Peter file. Okay, so um, you might know the name now. Um, <clears throat> it's um, a very, very funny coincidence. I did realize I know this person. I know him for several years. And so I took my time to write another mail um, and explain the whole situation. I wrote him that I had contact with the company uh, that was distributing his software, and I mentioned that I know him, and uh, I still had the feeling that this might be a coincidence and it wasn't um, the idea to, to steal my code, and um, it was just coincidence. Um, 
And I also mentioned in the first letter I, I have received from the company that said he, he is uh, very ill and he is going to die and uh, I hope, uh, wish him all the best. And um, yeah, I wrote him this email <coughs> and I have never received an answer. I hope he's not dead, I don't know. Um, but even funnier, years earlier I was discussing with him, uh, with him how to create a vulnerability scanner. And we were mailing back and forth. And back then, I was creating my attack toolkit and he was creating his software, which, which was named Use42. And um, he shared his source code with me. So in the end, I had the source code of, of the application he was selling. I had the source code, uh, at least a very early version of the application, which, which looked uh, not very familiar, familiar like the, the last version or the, the version I did the analysis. Therefore, I wasn't able to, to recognize, okay, uh, it's, it's in the end, it's the same software. But I still own uh, the code of his software and I am still thinking about publishing this code, but uh, um, the quality of the software isn't that good and I don't think I make anyone uh, uh, something good with that. So um, the problem was um, my media offensive was going on and the target company wasn't very happy with the bad PR they were receiving. <coughs> so in, in, in the first place, they stopped selling the software and they said that they are going to hire an expert, which is going to clarify if my um, statements are true or not. Um, afterwards, they re-released their software and said in the media that I was lying, which of course I didn't like very much. Um, Still then, it was interesting to see on all the, the boards, the people were discussing, um, still most of them, 99% were sharing my opinion and the rest was sharing the opinion of the opposition, uh, which made me very happy because in the meanwhile, I wasn't even really sure if I was right or if I was just a confused person. <coughs> then um, I've heard of this ex expert opinion they were making and I, I was very eager to see what, what this expert is going to document and uh, I was praying to God, oh, it would be so funny if I had access to this expert opinion and I thought, okay, it was great if I opened my door, uh, there would be lying this expert opinion and the next day I woke up, I opened my door and there was lying this expert opinion. I don't know who put it there, um, I really have no idea, but I had access to this expert opinion. <coughs> and. Um, I have learned one particular thing from reading this expert op opinion, um, which I will share afterwards. <laughs> All right, um, so talking about expert opinions. Um, as we've just heard, not only Mark, but also his adversary, they both uh, spent, I guess, considerable time in order to write their own expert opinions. Um, let us ask, is, would this be of any use if it then came to a court proceeding? And related to the question, how does a court establish whether a violation of a copyright has occurred or not? Um, generally, yes, the court will and will have to rely on, a, on an expert opinion. However, what the court does is that it does not rely on the well on the so-called expert opinion or on the real expert opinion one of the parties has done, but it will well order to be done um, one by a neutral expert, which will be court appointed. So the court will decide with the based well probably based on the party's input, uh, decide on an on a neutral third-party expert, and this guy will then. Um, provide his expert based on specific questions which will be asked by the court. Um, as a potential claimant or a defendant in such a proceeding, you may want to know that uh, such expert opinion may uh, cost a bit and it will usually be the party not prevailing in the procedure who is then in the end going to pay for this expert opinion. So it. Well, if the, if the case is really complicated, uh, it may also be pretty expensive then, and this is what you have pointed at before correctly. Um, the private expert opinion, well, I call it private, I mean the one he has done or the other party has done, uh, it's not that the court won't read it, but it will be considered as mean, mere party pleading, so it does not have the value of uh, real evidence 
um, but it's just what he says as party and as party is obviously not neutral. So it won't have the value of a real expert opinion, even though it may be better than the, the one ordered by the court. But that's just a side remark. Um, what will the expert analyze? He will generally look at all elements of software which are granted copyright protection. So as we've seen before, he will probably first look at the, the, the concept of software, um, how things are organized, how the architecture is done. I mean by architecture, I mean how, how the, the software works, not technically, but rather on a conceptual basis. Um, but then in addition, he will also look at the source code and at the object code. Um, and you may notice that in order to do so, he will have to, to have guidance. And this is probably the most important thing. You can't just go to the court and claim, well, my software has been stolen and there, there is this other software and it's identical. But you have to provide the court with very specific guidance uh, probably as he did, saying that, well, here we have this line of source code, we have that, we have this, so that the court is then able to say to the expert what he's going to, or what he has to analyze. Um, and really the mere description of software, if you simply state, well, my software may be used in order to, to do this and that, that won't be enough, and then the court will just simply dismiss your claim, saying, well, you don't have specified what really you claim is done wrong in the case at hand. So uh, I did realize one thing with the expert opinion that I was able to, to read, and uh, this is the fact that not everyone is an expert. Uh, well, there was a lot of funny typos in the expert opinion of uh, the other company. Okay, he might not be an expert in, in language. Um, what was really strange was that he was comparing the compiled versions of the software. But my claim was that uh, they were using source code and my application was open source, so they had access to my source code and they were the company that was distributing the software and I hope they had access to the source code too, therefore it would have been possible to do a source code analysis. analysis. <coughs> then, uh, but was uh, much funnier was that the expert claimed that I have lost all my rights of my software because I have published it as open source. And that's pretty strange and it, it doesn't really make sense. Um, and uh, what was even funnier, he claimed that the 380 plugins they have stolen, they have stolen all plugins, 380, uh, it must have been an accident and it might be just a coincidence. Okay, they were, they were testing for the same 380 vulnerabilities, they were using the same ex uh, attack vectors, the same exploits, the same payload, and for 380 exploit plugins, and it might just be a coincidence, I don't know, I, I don't really believe in that. Uh, and, and it was pretty strange because the expert was uh, only um, quoting Wikipedia, and yeah, I don't know if, if Wikipedia is the, the right source to be quoted in a legal case. <coughs> okay, just one, uh, going back one slide, just one remark to um, the statement that he has lost all rights. I mean, I, I won't, I, I come back to this uh, later, but uh, just to have a, an, an idea of what an expert opinion should be. I mean, as generally, an expert will only make factual statements. So he will never have to have, well, to, to legally judge a case. And what he said here that he lost all rights is definitely a legal statement. So uh, this is actually not the expert's business. Um, going a bit further um, to, well, to, to really the, like the, the core of the case, let's call it like this. Um, what protection is then granted by the Copyright Act? So if we have established that the software at the hand uh, is an individual, individual creation of the human mind, so it qualifies as work, but what does this well bring then? Um, generally, uh, the author has the exclusive right to own his work. 
he has the right to recognition to, uh, of his ownership and of his authorship, which includes the right to always be acknowledged as author when the software is published or used or distributed, whatever. But furthermore, he has also the right to decide whether, when, and how his work may be published, and whether, when, and how it may be used. Um, this is now, generally speaking, based on the Copyright Act. We, does it, it does apply to open source software. So the statement the, the expert made, person to which you lose your copyrights once you've published the source code, is definitely wrong. Um, but it does not apply to software um, licensed under the GPL, but I will talk about this just in a minute. And if we talk about software which is protected by the Copyright Act, so without GPL, um, the author's right to recognition of his authorship is then the key to defend against software plagiarism. Because usually, if a third party takes your software, steals it, and publishes it, he won't say, well, Mark has written it. So his basic right to be acknowledged as author is definitely violated. And as such, well, yeah, the other one is not doing what he should. <laughs> um, as I said, just uh, the mere fact that you publish source code does not change anything in this regard. So what I've just said is equally valid to, with regard to propri proprietary software as well as to open source software. No, we're too far. <laughs> um, particularities with regard to the general public license, um, there are many. So talking to, to some people in my office, talking, telling them about this case. Uh, and then I, at a certain point, I said, well, Mark published the software on the GPL. And you know, being like business lawyers, they just said, oh, well, he's crazy. Um, but of course, you may most likely contradict to this statement. Uh, it's just to illustrate that when you publish software using GPL, you're definitely on other grounds than you would be if you would just publish it under, I say, normal copyright protection. Um, the first question is how to include the license when you distribute software. The license, and GPL is a license, is an agreement, so you can't really impose it on your counterparty. Um, your counterparty has to agree to use this license as contractual basis for his use of the software. Now, this sounds very sophisticated. Uh, you don't have to, to sit together and write down an agreement. But what, ne what, well, what is required is that in the moment the user well, gets possession or starts using the software, he needs to know that you do only distribute it on basis of the GPL. And he then needs to somehow well, give his approval to using it under this license. And this is usually done then by you have a, well, a pop-up where it states, well, you have to accept the license. And this is the, well, the important point, how to include software. I've read in the documentation Mark has provided me with that his counterparty claimed that, well, we didn't even know that it was GPL. So, I mean, this would be potentially a valid statement. It wouldn't make their case better, but there is a risk that if you write it somewhere where the user of software has just no chance to, to see that it's GPL, he just can't validly uh, give his approval to the use of this license. Um, now to the rights, I, I will skip rights and obligations of the licensor because it's very much related to the rights and obligation of the licensee, obviously. Uh, let's have a look at the rights of the licensee. Most importantly, especially as opposed to the protection granted on the Copyright Act, he has the right to copy and modify the source code and the object code. Um, this is a very general statement. There are then legal scholars who argue that, well, if the, the person modifying software does it so poorly that your, well, your own integrity and uh, reputation would be damaged if it was mo modified in, in, in such way that this would then ra violate the author's personality rights. So you can modify it, but potentially not very, very, very poorly. So <laughs> 
you, you are granted a little, a little protection. Uh, in addition, the licensee is further allowed to distribute software, um, be it physically or online. The latter is disputed, but I think that also online distribution is included, especially if the author of the GPL software um, publishes it online as well. Uh, he has not only rights, but he has also obligations. Um, he must, of course, open source, make available not only the object code, but he must also make available the source code if he distributes your software. Uh, he must there include the, the text of the GPL or at least a reference where it is uh, easy to get. And he may not charge a royalty for distributing the software. So he may not well, try to achieve a, a license fee. What he may, however, is that if he distributes the software on a CD, for instance, he may charge for the physical CD. Well, so he may sell the CD, but not royalties for what it's on there. Um, and most importantly, probably the so-called copyleft effect, of which I'm sure you have heard, uh, is that the modified software may then only be distributed again under GPL. And in this regard, GPL is considered as, let's say, the, the, the most uh, rigid license. So you really, really have to publish whatever you have used, well, if you use so GPL-based software in your own software, you then have to publish it under GPL again. Prob not if the parts you use are like really a separate part, but no. Um, so what we see is that the licensee under GPL has far more rights than he would have just based on normal copyright protection. And in this regard, interesting to know is that the GPL contains a provision according to which as soon as the licensee violates the license, so for instance, if he publishes uh, your GPL software without publishing the source code, he violates the license. And this is under the license deemed to auto-terminate the license. So it will end, he will be back on the Copyright Act protection, and he will have far less rights than he had before. Um, so, yeah. What should Mark have done? <laughs> um, I mean, with regard to the inclusion of GPL, it's what I've just said. So if you wish to include it, you need to make sure that your licensee really has to agree to use this license. You don't hide it that far away, hidden, so that no one can see it. Um, but more practically, I suggest you act quickly. It's especially if you intend to have a court to, I mean, if, 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 if you really want to do something, you may consider asking the court to um, issue a pre preliminary injunction, which will then, with immediate effect, um, prevent your counterparty from further publishing the software you claim he has stolen. But in order to do so, you need to act quickly. I mean, you can't, it doesn't mean that you can't exchange letters and try to, to reach an out-of-court settlement beforehand, uh, but you shouldn't wait, I'd say you shouldn't wait month. So, and then act, well, I say act decisively, act firmly, uh, usually, especially if you have a, like a big firm on the other side, uh, if you just write them a nice letter, they will say, yeah, as they have done with you. And they will say, well, mm, it's all nice, uh, but it's just not true. So you have to have a certain decisiveness in writing your letter, which of course th doesn't mean that you should uh, threaten them or uh, yeah, just be careful, but firm and decisive. And probably most important also is uh, that you safeguard evidence as Mark has said, they, after confronting them with the examples uh, where you see that they have copied or may have copied software or parts of his code, uh, they so, well they immediately started changing it. So before giving them what you think proves your case, uh, you should make sure that you have everything on file, not that the day after you go and have a look and well, it's nothing there anymore. And uh, in addition to what I've said, you may uh, consider criminal prosecution because uh, 
most acts violating the or most conduct violating the Copyright Act does also qualify as criminal offense. And this may help you, especially in cases where you are afraid of uh, starting a civil procedure, having to prove everything, having a big risk uh, to bear costs in the end where you need a lawyer. So sometimes it helps if you just go to the, to the police or to the uh, criminal prosecution and claim that there has been a violation of the Copyright Act and then they should actually start to investigate and also to, to, to safeguard proofs and gain evidence. Uh, one more remark, um, Mark has said that lawyers told him that because he gave the software away for free, he doesn't really have lost profits. That this is true, but there is also the possibility that if you have software which is used copyright protection and then it is used by a third party firm who sells the software, there is also the possibility that you try to claim what they gained using your copyright your copyright. So this is usually the, the, the most uh, most um, promising way forward, I think. So uh, we're running a bit out of time. Just one thing, um, while I was analyzing the software, I have realized it has a lot of security issues and um, I won't go into details, but the quality of the software was pretty poor and it was even possible to own the scanner remotely. So uh, I wouldn't have spent money for the software. Um, my quick summary, uh, Legal prosecution is not easy, especially if you're not a, a specialist or have access to a specialist. Um, as uh, Luca said, act quickly and take a good lawyer. He is my weapon of choice. And uh, you have the possibility to learn from my fails. I hope this is useful. Um, then licenses and copyrights aren't the same. And uh, fight for your right as long as you think you are right. Um, the case is well documented. This is my last time I will uh, discuss this case. Uh, it's, it's closed for me and it doesn't make sense for me to di discuss it any further. If you have interest to take a deeper look in, in, into my analysis, feel free. Um, I don't know if you have time for questions. Well, I mean, Generally, there is a risk that if you wait too long, the court will just say, well, now you've, you've tolerated it, you have agreed to them using your software, and they will just say, well, okay, now it's too late. This is generally speaking. But more specifically, if you try to, to have, if you want to ask the court to act immediately, especially, for instance, without talking first to the counterparty, what you need is you need to have a, an urgent case. And if you wait too long, your case is just not urgent anymore. You can't go to the court and say, well, you now need to issue this injunction today. Don't talk to the counterparty. It's really, we need to hurry. And then they see, well, you first noticed this uh, six months ago, then you did nothing for two months. Uh, you talked to them for four months. So it's, it just, it won't be urgent anymore. But there is no need to rush. You always have time to think what you're doing. So it's just don't wait too long. Any further questions? Uh, this is a very good question. When I was preparing the presentation, I was going to the website, to their online shop, and uh, the so software is still announced there, and, if, uh, and uh, there is still a link to download the trial version. If you click on the link, there comes a message which, uh, which says uh, the software isn't available anymore, but it's still uh, in the online uh, whatsoever. So I contacted them and asked, uh, hey, I'm preparing uh, an evaluation of security scanners please send me a current version of the software. And uh, the woman on the phone told me that they aren't selling the software at the moment. But the problem was I was um, saying I was Mark Ruff and I'm not sure if they realized who I was and if this was just the answer that was prepared for my person. So I don't really know. Anyone else? Revenge for my uh, appearance in the media. Uh, 
or, 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 or uh, no, th this is my little revenge, and uh, yeah, it was fun, and I hope it was fun for you too. But uh, in the end, no one really cares. <laughs> is this it? So thank you very much for your time, and I hope it was a bit entertainment. <laughs>